morning, church. In case you're uh, visiting with us this morning, my name is Joe Brantley, and I'm the associate pastor and youth pastor here at Concord. It's my pleasure to be standing in front of you and sharing God's Word with you this morning. So if you, you have a copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to open it up to Joshua chapter 9 as we continue in our study of Joshua. Uh, I just want to open up with a question. Has, has there ever been a generation who has not experienced conflict as a part of everyday life? I think about that. Has there ever been a generation that is, has not experienced some sort of conflict as a part of everyday life? And I think the Apostle Paul prepares us as Christians, believers in Christ, that no Christian can expect to be immune from conflict as he tells us, against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil, even in heavenly places, all of which are the schemes of the devil. Simply put, whether you are a believer or a non-believer, I would tell you this, the devil doesn't take any days off. Satan doesn't take any days off. So, I want you to understand this, and this doesn't just apply to out there, it also applies to in here. That, that, that's why Jesus told his disciples that do not think I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. He tells his disciples this because we are in a conflict so this is what I know. There are two kinds of people, those who are spiritually blind and those who have been awakened by the Holy Spirit to a resurrected Christ, but both deal with conflict in this world. Both. And we, Christians, should not be ignorant to think that we are not in the midst of a spiritual battle. I mean, it's not a battle concerning land, per se, like the Israelites are dealing with here in the text. But, but it's, it's, it's not the promised land of, in the Old Testament, but it is a place. It's a promised eternal destination. It's a promised eternal resurrection where we are restored to our Creator through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's promised. But, but, as long as you are in this fallen world, be assured, you are in a fight. We, we are in a fight, a spiritual conflict, and our adversary doesn't take any days off. He is cunning, he is deceitful, and he doesn't fight fair. He does not fight fair. Matter of fact, this is how our, our enemy would attack. This is how he attacks. If you're ignorant and blind to the gospel, he wants you to stay that way. He wants you to stay exactly the way you are. He will continue to give you every excuse that you can rattle off as to why you don't need God, why you don't like the people of God, how He's taken people that you loved away from you, how He's taken the things of this world that you so desperately need away. Heck, you can even turn this into a country song and blame Him for why you kicked the dog. The point is, is that the, if that's you, the devil's got you right where he wants you. If that's you, the devil's got you. But here's what's scary. Believers, are you listening? Amen. Let me tell you something. This is, this is what's scary. If you are a child of God... One who has awakened to the gospel. The scales have fallen off your eyes. He has revealed himself to you. You were blind. And now you see, if that's you, Christian, hear me. The enemy cannot have you. He cannot have you. Never. He can't ever, ever have you. But. But. What he can do is make you ineffective. He can make you ineffective. 
He can't have you. He can't have you because you have been washed by the blood of Jesus and you have been grafted into the family of God by the saving grace of Jesus Christ. He can't have you. You were once far off, but now He's brought you near. You are adopted. And Satan can never, ever have you, praise God. He can't have you, but he can make you ineffective so that your life looks no different than those who are walking around ignorant to the things of God. He can, he can make you ineffective. He will use the desires of this world to break you down, forget about who it is that rescued you, he will deceive you into believing the lies that he would whisper into your heart, counting on them to take root and choke out the truth and the light that lives within you so that you could not win another soul to the kingdom of God. That's what he does. That's our enemy. And he doesn't take any days off. He never stops. People, we are in constant conflict. You tracking with me? Amen. We're in constant conflict. There's one commentator that, that Daryl and I have both been reading throughout this study of Joshua by the name of David Jackman. And he says this, listen to this. He says, there is no easy ride for the people of God in a fallen world, for it lies in the powerful grip of the evil one. Listen. Realism recognizes that conflict is, a, is widespread in human life and unavoidable for a Christian disciple. Basically, what he's saying, if we just get real, that as Christians who are trying to walk the walk, who are trying every day to become more like Jesus, who are in this process from one degree to another to being sanctified, that basically if we get real, we're going to face conflict in our life. It's unavoidable. And then Jackman, what he does is he starts to encourage us how we should be aware of our enemy, especially, especially as we start to, to read and study the Old Testament. He says this, he says, one fruitful way of reading the Old Testament, listen to this, this is good, is to trace the devil's constant resistance to the purposes of God as he does everything possible to prevent the coming of the offspring of the woman who will crush the serpent's head. Whew. That's good. That's what he wants to do. He wants, he wants, if you are blind and ignorant to the gospel, he wants you to stay that way. And if you have already, if your soul has been won to the kingdom, he wants to make you ineffective to make sure nobody else goes. That's our enemy. So let's start our drift into what God would show us in his word today. In Joshua chapter 9, verse 1. As we start to see now as the promised land begins to be realized in Israel's experience. It's not surprising that the opposition increases. That, that conflict would arise in, in its size and intensity. So, so conflict, it's happening. The people of Israel are starting to, to experience it. So let's dive into the text. Follow along as I read Joshua 9, starting in verse 1. As soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country, and then the lowland along the coast of the great sea towards Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites heard of this. Now look at verse 2. Specifically, I want you to look at verse 2. They gathered together as one to fight against Joshua. So right there, let's pump the brakes. I want you to, I want you, if you would, take your Bibles. Let's flip back to Joshua chapter 5. Just flip back. 
Joshua chapter 5, verse 1. And I, and I just want, I want us to, to look at what we, we just read in, in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Now let's look at Joshua chapter 5, verse 1. And it says this. It says, As soon as all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west, and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan. You remember that? For the people of Israel, after he had dried up the waters of the Jordan, for the people of Israel, until they had crossed over, look, look what it says next. These, these same kings, these people, it says their hearts melted, and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. Now let's reread chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. As soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the lowland, all along the coast of the great sea towards Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites heard of this, they gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. My question is, what happened? Well, I mean, let's be real. The, the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, they were pagans. They were blind and ignorant to the things of God. And we see here in chapter 5, verse 1, that because of what, what they heard about the God of Israel, what they heard about what he had done in the drying up of the Jordan so that the Israelites could cross, the text says that their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. They had lost heart. They lost hope in being able to fight a people whose God could do such mighty things. So as, a, as, as the people of Israel continue, as we've, we've studied and we've read over the past few weeks, we, we start to see that they suffer a defeat at Ai. So, so, so we know because of the text it was because of Achan's sin. But the inhabitants of Canaan didn't know that. And, and though the Israelites defeated Ai, once they reconciled with the Lord and the inhabitants of Canaan started to listen, the inhabitants of Canaan started to listen to our adversary. They would listen to him start to speak lies as he whispers lies into their hearts and discredits the Israelites in their defeat in Ai. And he leads them to believe there's weakness there. There's a weakness there. You know, I, I think we can... They, they've been beat once. If we get everybody together, even though we don't get along with all these different groups, if we, we pull everybody together, AI did it, maybe, maybe there's a shot. Maybe there's a chance. So the devil starts to whisper that lie into their hearts. And, and, and it, it just he leads them to believe there is a weakness within their God, the God of Israel, and that he has failed his people. They didn't realize that it was the Israelites who had failed not only their God, but themselves. And you know what? Just, just thinking about this, this should make total sense to us. Because even as people of God... Believers, how often do we do exactly what we see in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2? Think about that for a minute. Think about it. We will come together with people we consider our enemies in order to achieve an agenda just to see it go our way. I've witnessed this. Ashamedly, I've done it. I've seen it happen in the church. I've seen it happen in family and community settings. And I would, I would dare to say, I bet you have too. That people would, would, would become allies with their enemies, even for a short time, just so they could achieve something that they want. We can always go back to being enemies. But right now, let's work together. So I can be happy with my situation right now. And it's because of our own selfish desires we experience this people. We experience it with the enemy will whisper strategies and agendas 
and it will help us conspire with people that we don't agree with, or it's just plain and simple people we don't even like, just to get what we want. That's what, that's what the enemy does, just so we get our way. Look at verse 2. They gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. People, I'm telling you, our enemy doesn't take any days off. He will sow lies into our hearts to accomplish pain and destruction against the kingdom. And if he can do it to us, those who call ourselves the people of God, how much more can he use those who are blind and ignorant to the power of God, those who deny his authority over their lives in creation as a whole? How much more can he do it to them? I think that's weighty enough for us to, to pray through. I think that's weighty enough for us to pray through. And maybe, and, and this is the thing, and this is, this is what God's been pressing into me this week as I've studied this text, that, that maybe there is a residue of pain from a situation that you've been involved in that's eating away at your heart, and it causes you to ache. And it affects your worship. It will affect your worship. Because you're holding on. Can I, just, can I just speak this over you as the Lord spoke this over me this week? The enemy will use that residual hurt. He will use that residual hurt to weaken your faith in a God that can completely heal you. Completely. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And we need to pray through that. And there's going to be a time where, where we can, we can just, maybe today, maybe right now, right where you're sitting, we just, maybe you need to repent of something and allow the, the gospel to eradicate this residual hurt that the enemy is using against you. Because let me tell you something, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So maybe, maybe that's you. Maybe that speaks to you. Because let me tell you something. It speaks to me. It's weighed heavy on my heart this week. And there's a time in this service. Maybe you need to do it right now. And if you need to bow your head and talk to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, go ahead. But there will be a time where you can come to the altar. And surrender whatever it is. And as the word continues to weigh on you and press on you. I pray that's something that... that God will bring to your mind, bring to your heart. So, let's read on. Joshua 9, verse 3. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they on their part acted with cunning. Let's pause. Cunning. Now, I looked it up. I know what it means, but I looked it up because I wanted to see what... Dictionary.com had to say about it. it. said, skilled employed in a shrewd or sly manner, as in deceiving or craftiness. So, verse 4, check this out. Look, 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 what, look what the Gibeonites are doing here. They are on their part, acted with cunning, and went and made ready provisions. And look at this. This is, I mean, I want you to check this out. These guys are slick. Check this out. They, they went and made ready provisions and took worn out sacks for their donkeys and wineskins, worn out and torn and mended with worn out patch sandals on their feet and worn out clothes. And all their provisions were dry and crumbly. And they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and, the men, and to the men of Israel, We have come from a distant country. So now make a covenant with us. Do you, do you see what these guys are doing? I mean, I don't know if you, you quite get it yet. You will as we start to unpack the text. These guys are slick. They're neighbors. 
They're neighbors to where, where the, the, the Israelites are encamped. They're neighbors to them, but they, they've gone and they, they've, they've made it look like they've traveled this long distance. It, it'd be like, you know, uh, me running out of gas because I said, I've just traveled from Michigan or something. Could you help me out? And I just, just came from Camden Cove in Calera. I, maybe I was just over it, 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 in Columbiana at the courthouse. I tried to make it look like I've got something else going on, but, but I, I'm trying to make you think that I'm someone I'm not. These guys are good. These guys are good. I mean, this is basically, I'm just going to be straight with you, this is basically the blueprint for how I got Stephanie to marry me. This is, I mean, this is exactly what happened. I mean, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, man, these are my people. I thought I was Scotch Irish. I may be Gibeonite. This is amazing. I mean, I mean, look at this. Look at verse 7. But the men of Israel said to the Hivites, look at this. Perhaps you live among us. Perhaps you live among us. Then how can we make a covenant with you? Oh, look at this. Flattery always works. Verse 8. Check this out. Oh, oh, they said to Joshua, oh, we are your servants. And Joshua said to them, well, who are you? And where do you come from? Look at verse 9. They said to him, from a very distant country, your servants have come. Flattery again. From a very distant country, your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard a report of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan and, and to, to Sion, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, and who lived in Ashtaroth. So our elders and all of the inhabitants of our country said to us, Take provisions in your hand for the journey and go meet them and say to them, We are your servants. Come now and make a covenant with us. Here's our bread. It was, it was still warm when we took it from our houses as our food for the journey on the day we, we set out to come to you. But now behold, it's dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new when we filled them and behold, they have burst. And these garments and sandals of ours are worn out from this very long journey. These guys are good. They are selling it. They went through all this trouble to trick the Israelites to make it look like they're somebody they're not. Just so they, they, they could experience grace and not wrath. But just for a moment, can, can we just look at the duality of deception that's going on? That, that's occurring throughout this text? There's this dual action of deception that's taking place. In verses 1 and 2, we see Satan, the enemy, deceiving some of the inhabitants of Canaan in a way that they would unite and fight against the people of Israel. Yet another enemy of the people of Israel is using deception to join them in covenant relationships so they will not suffer the wrath of a mighty God. And God's instruction was clear when it came to the people of Canaan. Now, you don't have to turn to this, but I'm going to put it on the screen. Deuteronomy 7, 1 and 2. You can mark it down. You can look at it. Go back and read it later. But I want you to look at this. God, his instructions were clear. He said in, in verse 1, Deuteronomy 7, verse 1, When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you, and when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete what? Destruction. You shall make no covenant with them. What are the Gibeonites asking them to do? 
They're asking them to make a covenant with them. It's clear. God's instructions are clear in Deuteronomy 7, 1 and 2. You shall not only destroy them, but you will not make a covenant with them. And look at this. He goes karate kid on him. He says, show no mercy. Straight up Cobra Kai. No mercy. Sweep the leg. We're not playing. I mean, it, it, it's, God's instructions are pretty clear. So we have the enemy of this world, Satan, working through all the other inhabitants of Canaan, deceiving them to fight against Israel. And then we have the Gibeonites who are outside of God's chosen people. And because of this, according to God's word, they shall perish with all the other inhabitants of Canaan. And they are trying to deceive the people of God, trick them, if you will, in order that they would allow them to be grafted in through covenant relationships so they can avoid the destruction that they're supposed to receive. You know what? This is an uncanny picture of deception at work in this text, one which would deny the power of God. And another that acknowledges it so desperately that they're attempting to slide in. Do you see that? Are you tracking with that? One set of deception would deny the power of God and is being deceived that God's not powerful enough to stop them. We can, we can, we can take them. We can win. If we unify and come together, we can win this thing. And then the other set of deception is working. These people believe that God is doing something so powerful that they're willing to lie just to get in to avoid destruction. The duality of deception here is pretty, pretty miraculous just to see how this is working. And the people, these people, the, the, they're just outside of the covenant. The Gibeonites are outside of God's covenant and protection and bound and damned to destruction. And they're trying to con, listen to me, they're trying to con their way into a coexistence, a cohabitation with the people of Israel simply because they believe in the power of, and, and they fear Israel's God. God's instructions are clear in Deuteronomy. But as we look at verse 14, we see where the breakdown occurs. Look at verse 14. So the men took some of their provisions. So that means they took this, this, these provisions that they provided... They took their bread and, and their wineskins. They took them and they, they observed them. And they're like, yeah, this is dried and crumbly. This isn't fresh baked. This may be, you know, this is more than Dale bread here. So they, they took it and they're, they're seeing for themselves. They're testing it themselves. But here's the key, the backside of verse 14. So they took some of the provisions, but they did not ask counsel from who? They didn't ask counsel from the Lord. And then Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them and he let them live. And the, and the leaders of the congregation then swore to them. Just, just for the sake of personal application to the text, before we start throwing stones at Joshua and calling him an idiot like the people that he, he, he's you know, leading are about to do, how many of us have ever entered into some type of life-changing commitment without seeking the counsel of God? Before we start to throw stones and say, Joshua must be an idiot, and start doubting his leadership, how many times have we entered into some type of life-changing commitment and never even thought twice about asking God? I mean, whether, whether it was picking what college you would attend or picking what field you might study and, and choosing a career or, or, or even what person you would date. What person you would biblically know, meaning that you would give yourself to. Who you would marry. If you should take that job. And, and just a bit simpler, Daryl and I were discussing this morning, should I buy that or not? Do I really need that new car? Do I need those new set of Ginsu knives? <laughs> I know you want them. But do I need them? Do we seek the counsel of God in those things? We could, I mean, we could make lists. 
we could make lists that, that, you know, until all the other churches in town got finished and, and, and had lunch, and then we could have Zappa Pan, Zaxby's, and Cracker Barrel all to ourselves. I mean, we could make lists for days about this. But let's look at verse 15 again. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them and let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore to them. Verse 16, at the end of three days, this is where the gig is up. At the end of three days, after they had made a covenant with them. After they had made a covenant with them. You see that? Everybody tracking? After they had made a covenant with them, they heard... They're actually neighbors. It says it in the text. He says it heard that, that they were neighbors and that they lived among them. But, but, but wait, you said you live far off. <laughs> yeah, that's what we said. <laughs> you fell for it. Uh, they, they're saying you, they, 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 they're, what, they're neighbors? They're neighbors and they live among us. So verse 17, and the people of Israel set out and reached their cities on the third day. Now, their cities were Gibeon. Kepharah, Beroth, and Keroth Jarim. Verse 18, but the people of Israel did not attack them. Why? Because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. Let me explain something to you people. No matter how stupid you want to call these guys for buying in, at least they were honorable. They made a covenant with God. You know, it's like, hey, my bad. They got us, but I've made an oath to the Lord. How quick are we to back out on God? How quick are we to want to take it back and be like, well, you know, well, that just wasn't fair. They suck it up. They're like, hey, they got us. So they did, not, they did not attack them because they had made a covenant with them. Because they had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. Then all the congregation, look at this. This is so us. Look at this. Then all the congregation murmured against the leaders. That's just what we do. That might as well have said, this is, this is how you start a church. I mean, that, that's what, but, but it didn't say that in the text, but this is what happens. It's just like, we're going to follow you, and then when you mess up, we're going to be like, I can't believe they did that. How could they do something? I mean, you know, this is what happens. People make mistakes. Things happen. Look, verse 19, but all the leaders said to all the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we may not touch them. So this we will do to them. Let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath we swore to them. It's not that it just meant something between them and the Gibeonites. It meant something between them and God. They didn't just swear to the Gibeonites. They swore to God. And the leader said to them, let them live. Look at this. So even though they tricked themselves into this situation, they didn't quite get away scot-free. It says, so they became cutters of wood and drawers of water for all the congregation, just as the leaders had said of them. Verse 22, look at this. Joshua summoned them. Can't you just imagine the frustration of Joshua? He's like, guys, you know, we talked, we had a moment, I thought we were good. Why? Look at what Joshua is doing. He says, he summoned them and he said to them, Why did you deceive us, saying that we are very far from you when you dwell among us? Now, therefore, you are cursed, and some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood, and drawers of water for the house of my God. And they answered Joshua, because it was told to your servants for a certainty that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and destroy all the inhabitants of the land or before you 
So we feared greatly for our lives because of you and did this thing. In verse 25, and now behold, we are in your hand, whatever seems good and right in your sight to do to us, do it. So he did this to them and delivered them out of the hand of the people of Israel. And they did not kill them. They kept their word. Verse 27, but Joshua made them that day cutters of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord to this day in the place that he should choose. Can I tell you something? However they got in, it's much better to be a laborer for Christ than it would be to perish in hell for eternity. You tracking with me? To be cursed, to be a servant of God for the rest of your life? There's something messy and sloppy about the way the Gibeonites got grafted in. There is. There's something messy and sloppy about it. I mean, the, the, the way they got grafted into the covenant people of God. But there's also something powerful and beautiful that points towards the future here. The attitude of the Gibeonites really speaks in this text. They, they are content to put themselves and their future into Joshua's hands by submitting to him. Look at, look at the latter part of verse 25. Whatever seems good and right in your sight do to us, do it. This is a great statement of submission, which illustrates the fear of the Lord, which Proverbs tells us the fear of the Lord is indeed the beginning of wisdom. So the, the note there at the end of verse 27, that the Gibeonites continued in Israel to this day, is a significant pointer to the future. Promises made, in the name of Yahweh, are never to be broken. Did you hear me, church? Promises that are made in the name of Yahweh, our great God, are never to be broken. And we see examples of this throughout the Scriptures over and over and over again. And if you read your Bible, you'll run in right into one. I'm just telling you. The grafting of the Gibeonites, it also does something else. It points, it pointed me in my reading towards another grafting of people who though were not a part of God's chosen people but through God's grace and mercy and because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his victory over sin and death he adopted yet another wayward messy group of people into his family. Us. Us. And, and we get to read about this. Turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 11. It's in the, it's in the New Testament. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans chapter 11. I want you to see this. I want you to see this in the text. <coughs> Romans 11, starting in verse 11. Speaking of the Gentiles, so I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentile, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now I am speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry in order, to, in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their reject, rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Look at verse 16. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. 
But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, you church, although a wild olive shoot were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, look at this, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Guys, we're a bunch of wild olive shoots. That's what we are. And by the grace of God, we've been grafted into the root which is Christ. He is the vine. We are the branches. We're just a bunch of wild olive tree shoots that some, by the grace of God, got grafted into the olive tree. The kingdom of God. So how does God deal with the devil's devices? How do we make application to this? Well, Jackman writes this. He says... What is God teaching us? What is God teaching us about himself in this story? Surely we are, we are meant to see his overruling sovereign hand in everything that happened and through that his total rule and ingenious redirections both of the devil's attacks and of his people's weaknesses and imperfections. So again, how does God deal with the devil's devices? He uses human agents. Look at this. He uses human agents to keep the altar fires in the temple burning and to keep the water well supplied for the cleansing rituals so as to continue, increase, and extend Israel's worship of their living God. The very thing the enemy planned to destroy is preserved and enhanced through God's overhauling providence. Do you see that? What a blessing. The very thing the enemy planned to destroy is preserved and enhanced by God's overruling providence. This does not provide an easy excuse for our failure and sinful self-confidence, but it gives wonderful hope to those of us who are, who are only too conscious of our past mistakes. For those of us who are only too conscious of our weaknesses. It gives us hope. And the, the ingenious wisdom that belongs to God alone, he even calls the Gibeonites, the agents of deception, listen to this, he calls them to be rescued. It was their temporal blessing that their lives were spared, but their eternal blessing, that they were made members of the community of Yahweh in Israel, even though they were merely woodcutters and water carriers. Again, it's much better to be a servant of God than to perish for eternity. This is the glory of Yahweh. He cannot be outmaneuvered by human cunning or hindered by human weakness. 
That glory is shown in the grace that can turn a curse into a blessing. That can use our mistakes and foolishness to bind us more closely than ever to Him. That can reveal where we went wrong and make it become the means by which we can begin to go the right way. People, God is the hero of this story. God is the hero of this story, and that grace leads us directly to the cross. You with me? That grace leads us directly to the cross where we see in the clearest possible way the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Look at this. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through the righteousness leading to eternal life. Through who? Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray. Father God, in this place today, I would dare say there are many battles being fought. There are many conflicts going on in lives of of people sitting throughout this congregation and in houses sitting around this community. And throughout our state, throughout this country, we know we are at war. That there is a spiritual battle taking place right now in the hearts of your people and of the people who would deny you. So we we said, Father, that there are two kinds of people here today. There, There are those who just simply reject and deny that you are the God and creator of all things. Father, I pray that in their hearts today that they would just see a speck of who you are. In the text, the Gibeonites didn't necessarily worship the Lord. They just feared Him enough not to want to perish. And God can work with that. That means the Holy Spirit is doing a work inside of you. So if that's you today, would you just release whatever it is, what doubts that would hold you back and just allow yourself to to, to be moved in the spirit of God and at this place accept him as your Lord and Savior because he is the God who can do all things he can heal all things maybe there's a residue of pain in your life where you blame God or you blame the church you blame his people can heal that. Would you just give it to him? And for those of us who 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 are walking in faith, who are walking under the name of Christ as your your Lord and your risen Savior, maybe there's something that's happened in your life where you've just taken a step back. And maybe there, there's something that's just overcome you and you feel like, you know what, I've I've gone too far. I'm too distant. From God, Maybe you've gone a little bit prodigal. Could I just encourage you, Father, to speak into their lives today and help them see that, Lord, instead of running from you, that you would open, open arms, welcome them back, and they can run to you. Father, speak to them. Whatever speck of hurt that would lie in their heart to make them think that their mistakes are too much for you. They believe, Lord, but help them in their unbelief. Lord, I I surrender myself to you this morning and knowing that, Lord, I, I fail you in many ways, but acknowledge that your grace is enough. 
but as I read the scriptures and the weight of scriptures fall on me, I know that I cannot take advantage of that grace. May I go on sinning that grace may abound by no means. You know my heart, Father, and I've repented of many things. And there are people in here today who need to repent, who need to reconcile their relationship with you. Let them have freedom to do that in this place. I thank you for this word, Father. I thank you for how you used it in my life. And I pray that today you've spoken to someone. That it not be my words, but it be the words of the Holy Spirit. words of Yahweh that would weigh heavy on us and that would cause us to move. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen going to just let the spirit move you and let it make application where needed. Whatever God has said to you today, when God is speaking, this is the thing, this is what grace does. When he is moving in us and working in us, we simply just can't stand still. We can't simply just stay in our seat. We have to move. Otherwise, we would allow Satan to sow those seeds of doubt and discontent into our heart, and they would take root. If that's going on in your life, I say rebuke him today. And you know what? Give your life to God. Because it'd be better to be a servant of the Lord than to perish into hell for eternity. So let's praise that God that would give us grace and save us.